Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Toronto Reference Library and to Toronto Crime as Local History, Writing Historical Crime Books, with Peter Bronski, the Fall 2017 Writer in Residence. My name is Michael Calder and I'm a librarian here at the Toronto Reference Library. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwa and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, the meeting place of Toronto, from the Haudenosaunee word Taranto, is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to present in this territory. Before I introduce Mr. Bronski, I'd like to invite you to come to the Hinton Learning Theatre this Saturday, November 25th at 2 p.m. for From Author to Indie Publisher, Navigating the New World of Writing and Selling Books, Mr. Bronski's final program as Writer-in-Residence. I'll now introduce Mr. Bronski, who will then introduce us to his guests, Nick Hendley, Robert Hachowski, and Lee Miller. Peter Vronsky is an investigative historian and the author of Ridgeway, The American Fenian Invasion and the 1866 Battle that Made Canada, Serial Killers, The Method and Madness of Monsters, Female Serial Killers, How and Why Women Become Monsters, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka, The Ken and Barbie Killers, and Times Square Torso Ripper, True Story of Serial Killer Richard Cottingham. His third volume in his history of serial homicide, Sons of Cain, a history of serial killers from the Stone Age to the present, is scheduled to be released by Penguin Random House Berkeley Books in August 2018. Peter Vronsky worked as an investigative documentary television producer in Canada and overseas for 25 years, and recently earned a PhD in history at University of Toronto in the fields of criminal justice history and the history of espionage and international relations. He teaches history of espionage and international relations at Ryerson University. He is currently working on two new books, Toronto Blue, Power and Community and the History of the Toronto Police, 1834 to 2017, and an illustrated album, Toronto Notorious, Historical Crime Scene Photos from the Files of the Toronto Police. His website is www.petervronsky.org. Please join me in welcoming Peter Vronsky. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and, and let's maybe bring the guys on as well. Uh, this group effort today. We're here. Yeah, come on up, guys. We have Toronto's almost entire crime writing community here. Reed Miller. So we'll each come up and, and as, as, as they come up, I'll tell you a little bit about more about each speaker, but I'll start with uh, just describing my, my own work uh, and, and kind of the struggle that I think we all have in, in writing about historical Toronto crime cases. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to write about crime as it's happening because you, you're basically relying on not much more than what's uh, being reported in the newspapers or what you might hear in, in you know, a courtroom trial. But when you start going back 20 years, 30 years, uh, you're only left with um, you know, those newspaper reports. And, and of course, newspapers really aren't very good for writing history. Newspapers are notoriously uh, unreliable. Um, and, and, and so we often have to rely upon, um, you know, that road that always leads to every crime, and, and that's the files of the Toronto Police, um, and, and it's quite a struggle, and, and it's not just the Toronto Police, it's any police force that, that has a, um, 
a, a kind of policy of maintaining secrecy, because of course investigations happen in secrecy, it's natural, um, and it carries on historically because often in police files there are, there's so much information that police collect that is not necessarily relevant to the crime itself. Um, and so how do you access that? And, and most police departments routinely destroy that information rather than have it available uh, in later years. And, and, and so I think we'll all describe some of our experiences in finding lost material, recovering material, extracting material from institutions. Um, the, the other problem, of course, certainly in, in the case of, of you know, Lee Mailer and myself, who very much focus on serial killers and mass killers, uh, Toronto has not been a home for a lot of serial killers. Um, you know, that's good news, uh, <laughs> but not for guys like us. Um, so when I was writing my book, my first book, Serial Killers, and, and what, what, what got me writing about serial killers were, were these two random encounters I had with serial killers without realizing they were serial killers at that time. Um, that inspired me to kind of explore where they come from, and I, 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 you know, I wrote a history of them. And, I certainly wanted in this book, which I was writing for an American publisher, um, as a proud Canadian, I wanted a Canadian serial killer and possibly a local homeboy in Toronto. And um, I couldn't find one until I really dug back into the 50s and, and, and found this remarkable figure that, uh, you know, is a world-class serial killer in the sense of, you know, his story. Uh, this is Peter Woodcock. Uh, this is a serial killer who was 17 years old in the 1950s. Of course, the term serial killer didn't exist then, so he's kind of not on that historical record as a serial killer. Uh, serial killers were described as mass killers, so unless you know what you're looking for, you might not have even found it. Uh, Peter Woodcock, uh, at the age of 17, murdered three children, two boys and a girl. Um, in, 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 in Toronto. Uh, it was a notorious case. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, serial killers certainly today are not considered to be insane, but he was. Uh, you know, people just never heard of such a thing, somebody killing three people in three different episodes in the 1950s. That was a very rare occurrence, especially in Toronto. In the 1950s, we maybe had eight to 12 murders a year in Toronto. So suddenly you have these three committed by this teenage boy. Uh, so he's found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, and he ends up in the psychiatric system. And by the time I started writing my book, he was already written about by Mark Doreen uh, in a book by reason of insanity. And at that point he had changed his name to David Michael Kruger. He actually goes under three different names. Uh, Mark Bereed would just recently write an update on him as well, uh, under the name that he has become known as, uh, Peter Woodcock, and that's how I describe him in my book. But uh, I think what made Peter Woodcock, uh, this young boy, so sort of special in the pantheon of, of global serial killers, uh, is what happened afterwards. Um, Peter Woodcock is, as I say, uh, incarcerated in uh, psychiatric facilities, at Tangwishin, he ends up in Bro um, uh, Brockville. After 34 years, the psychiatrists figure Peter Woodcock might be getting better now. He's in his 50s. He's committed no offenses, has a clean record for 34 years, since 17 years old. You know, and now the psychiatrists figure maybe it's a good idea to give him a day out. Let's give him a day pass. I get you all know where this is going, right? <laughs> you know, let's give him a day pass uh, so he can go into the town, buy a pizza, and come back. And that's the day Peter Woodcock murders his fourth victim on, in the first hour of his day pass. Um, he doesn't even leave the psychiatric facility. He actually chops to pieces a fellow prisoner, uh, goes down, gets his pizza, and then turns himself in, stained in blood, 
uh, from his victim, uh, his fourth victim. This is a guy who's waited 34 years to kill again. He's, he's the incurable serial killer, the incurable psychopath. He's passed away now, uh, but, but I thought it's a remarkable story, the story of how, how this kind of um, you know, homicidal impulse just carries on and lives on for all this, you know, all these years. Um, and, and of course, he, you know, he's generating so much more you know, material. Nate, as well, I'm sure, mentioned the book he's working on. There's yet another permeation to this story that I haven't mentioned. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Nate as his book is about to uh, come out soon. Um, other than that, uh, I've been looking at uh, the Toronto Police itself as, as, as a history. Uh, I've been digging deeply for over 25 years in the Toronto Police files. Um, I started in the 1990s. Uh, the first thing I discovered about the Toronto Police, for example, is that it's one of the oldest modern municipal police forces in the world. Um, it's founded in 1834, which makes it older than the Boston Police. It's older than the NYPD, which was founded in 1845. Um, and really, the only modern municipal police department that outdates the Toronto Police is the London Metropolitan Police, which was founded um, in 1829. So we're just, you know, five years younger than what people normally say is the modern municipal police force, in, in at least the English-speaking world, the modern police force. So it's a very long history. Uh, and, and when I began my attempt to write a history of the Toronto Police, I just ended up looking at the Toronto Police in the Civil War era, what they were doing and how the Toronto Police functioned as a paramilitary, as a military intelligence unit, um, and the fact that we were in a kind of a uh, crisis, a, what we today describe a terrorist crisis with the Irish Republican Fenians, um, all that was in the Toronto Police uh, archives. At that time, they were stored in the basement of the parking garage uh, at, at College Street headquarters. And since then, they've been moved to, to um, Toronto uh, Municipal Archives. So Ridgeway was kind of a book that very much depended upon police archives for describing this period in Canadian history. Um, my interest, nonetheless, returned back, which is what I'm working on now, finally finishing uh, the actual book on the history of the police and its relationship with uh, the community. Um, and the relationship has always been the same, bad. Um, you know, and, and, and the question, of course, is, is you know, who does the police serve? Uh, you know, and, and, and looking at kind of the history of Toronto Police, its relationship with indigenous people, its relationship with Irish Catholics, its relationship with uh, emerging labor unions, um, with uh, certain neighborhoods in the city, you know, long before we began to see, um, you know, other ethnicities arriving here, one begins to see a kind of a historical pattern that, that emerges. So, you know, that's a textual form what, what, I'm, what I'm working with. And, and again, because many of these archives have been transferred to the municipal city archives, it's become much, much easier to access this material. Um, the other thing I'm working, of course, is, um, and I should mention, um, this is a kind of a thing, 1990 Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which hampers researchers significantly. Um, what it's, it basically states is a person's privacy, as of 1990, extends 30 years after their death. And so, I happen to be uh, digging through the police archives at the moment that this act was be had just been passed. And, and uh, there was this tendency to start destroying all the files that were 30 years after the event. If the files were cataloged by victim in terms of murder files, then everything from 30 years and earlier that they had not destroyed, they were now routinely pulping and, and destroyed, um, including this vast amount of photographic material and, and negatives that were uh, being shredded and pulped. And so, literally with the chief of police, William McCormick, and at that point, 
the Toronto Police had an official historian, a former police officer who was a history buff, was hired after he was retired as the historian. So the three of us would literally get into these dumpsters and start extracting this material and, and, and essentially saving it. Um, and, and I hope it's going to end up here in the Baldwin room as, as, as I'm finishing this, this, this project I'm trying to arrange for its transfer here. Um, the other thing, of course, was in the 1990s, a lot of police officers who had served uh, as early as the 1920s and 1930s were still alive or had just recently passed away. And so through the police department, we found families and retired police officers who themselves had kept an enormous amount of material as personal souvenirs. Plus their families were inheriting these incredible files of photographic images, which I'll show you a few here. Um, in which they didn't know what to do. And, and some of the images, of course, were grotesque images of crime scenes, victims, um, and, and, and the family somehow didn't know what to do with it, and nobody wanted it. So again, uh, Chief McCormick and uh, Jack and I had, had, had essentially retrieved this, this stuff. So um, the material kind of looks like this. Um, and what I was most interested in were uh, the geographic locations around the city. Um, I love those uh, Mike Feige books, uh, but this was, you know, photographs that were taken randomly. Uh, anybody recognize where this is? It's, it's about, sorry? It's Dining College? No, it's about 10 feet away from here. It's uh, Bloor, you're looking south along Bloor. Right, here's Frank Stollery's that just disappeared, right? Uh, and of course the Pilot Tavern used to be there. Uh, so, so you're looking just outside the doors where a homicide had occurred. And, and they have incredible definition, these images. You can just get very deeply into them. Uh, and, and of course the ch challenge was, was these were just raw negatives or, or, or photographs. We didn't know what, what case they belonged to or who the victim was or when they happened. And so we had to kind of, I had to do kind of detective work to assemble where this is. This alley, for example, is Bayfair Mews next to, uh, it's still there, you can actually see the two grates. And here this, this tarring was these two grates covered up, all right? Uh, so, uh, you know, using uh, kind of various clues, I'm able to kind of assemble the back story on, on some of these events. And this was a 1951 stabbing that had occurred just out in front of the doors here, uh, with the victim dying in, in, in that out. Uh, I, I, this one I've just recently resembled, and of course what, what fascinates me about these photographs is there's a kind of a narrative in them uh, that I'm, I'm managing to reconstruct as well. This was the so-called stalking strangler case in 1949. Uh, a murder in Cabbage Town. And, and you're looking again down Girard Street towards a river. And that's what it would look like in 1949. Uh, and these come from super high definition negatives that, of course, police investigators, photographers would shoot in large format for evidentiary reason. But, um, you know, it, it renders all this kind of detail. And of course, people are kind of caught at random in these photographs. Um, nobody is prepared to be photographed as in a crime scene. You know, it's not like you know Architectural Digest coming to your house. You you know clean the table and stuff. Uh, the cops just arrive the moment murder arrives on your doorstep. Uh, and a few hours later, people are being photographed. And neighborhoods are being photographed. This is River Street, south of, uh, north of Girard. And just routine life taking place. Um, again, this is what it looks like today. You see the kind of changes taking place. In my search for these photographs, Spruce Street, looking towards the Don Valley before, Don Valley Expressway. Okay. Google, of course, maps helps me locate many of these locations. 
And so once I can work out the geography, I can kind of try to work out the narrative of what these photographs are trying to present. Because these photographs would be presented later at trial in a court. It was a story. You know, every crime is a history in a way. The game today. And then that day where they find the body. The neighborhood. This is Dyer Lane. And again, you can again see the super high definition, how deep I was able to go in the photograph to get to that crowd. And this is not Toronto the good. That was the thing was just all these photographs I've been seeing, my filings, books, and other nostalgia books kind of celebrate Toronto the good. Um, there's also Toronto Notorious, uh, and, and, and this is it. Um, I'm not quite yet sure how to handle some of the more graphic photos. I mean, that's, that's a long discussion we're going to have with the publisher. Uh, because the question for all of us writing about this is, of course, in every book we write, in every crime story we write, is a victim. And, and, and so, you know, we're very much focused on trying not to lose sight of that, the killer's hands. So, um, as I say, it's just kind of a random sampling of, of, of some of the vistas uh, that have been lost to us, that, that we're going to be shredded. And, 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 and we managed to only go back as far as the 1930s. It appears that all the photographs from the 1920s and 1910s, when they started taking photographs in the early part of the century for police evidence, were already destroyed sometime in the 1950s before we got them. So we managed to just catch one little piece of, of the visual history of a kind of part of Toronto that, that you know, very few people have seen and has very rarely been, been, been seen. I love being able to actually look at the marquees and the posters, um, but you can get that much definition out of these photographs. There was a murder, a famous murder in the Roxy Theater in the 1930s. So, that's just like I say, a bit of a sampling and stuff that can be shown in public. Uh, a lot of the photographs are. Our, our, our graphic, which is going to be a big question of how we'll get archived, how, pe how people will have access to them, and, and, and so far. So the book, Toronto Notorious Historical Crime Scene Photographs from the Files of Toronto Police, probably out in about a year. Uh, so that takes care of uh, my presentation on, on, on what I'm doing. Uh, let me introduce you to my, my next uh, speaker, Nate Henley. Uh, is a Toronto-based author who's written a series of uh, true crime books. Uh, Al Capone, Chicago's Kid of Crime, Body and Clyde, uh, The Mafia, A Guide to American uh, Gangsters, The Outrageous Tale of Canada's Deadliest Feud, The Black Donnellys, Stephen Truscott, uh, Edwin Alonzo Boyd. Uh, he's currently writing a book that, you know, kind of connects up to the Woodcock uh, murder, uh, about a murder on the CNE grounds that led to the wrongful conviction of a Toronto teenager. Uh, Nate has written hundreds of articles for a wide variety of media outlets, including the National Post, the Globe and Mail, Business and Focus, Now Magazine, I, Weekly, and McLean's. Let's welcome Nate. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. Uh, as said, my name is Nate Hendley. I'm a Toronto journalist and true crime writer. I'm going to be speaking today about my two Toronto crime-related books on bank robber Edwin Alonzo Boy, the gentleman on the far right. And um, my second book is on uh, Ron Moffat, who was the teenager unjustly jailed for a murder he didn't commit in 1956.
The work on Boyd is the first book I ever wrote. The work on Ron Moffat, called The Boy on the Bicycle, has yet to be published. Look for it next May. I have some flyers uh, at the table if anyone is interested. Uh, some history in a hurry. Edwin Alonzo Boyd was the son of a Toronto police officer who headed up something called the Boyd Gang. The gang robbed a number of Toronto banks in the early 1950s. Uh, in a city with a low crime rate at the time, the Boyd Gang were a media sensation. It helped that Boyd was handsome and dramatic. He liked leaping on top of bank counters, gun in each hand, and shouting theatrically that a holdup was in progress. The gang robbed several banks and broke out of the Don Jail twice during their brief career. Eventually, all four members were captured and jailed, all four key members, I should say. Two members of the gang were hanged for murdering Toronto Police Officer Edmund Tong. Boyd died in 2002, age 88. His death was front page news in Toronto. At the time, I was a full-time journalist, and I had always wanted to write a book. I heard about an Alberta company called Altitude Publishing that specialized in short, punchy Canadian history. Pierre Burton Light, I called it. Um, they were looking for Ontario stories, so I pitched them a book on Boyd. They liked the concept. A chapter outline and contract ensued. I was hired to write a book about Edwin Alonzo Boyd. Now, the problem was, I had never written a book before, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I didn't belong to any writing groups at the time, or crime writing groups, and I didn't know any crime writers to ask advice. As a result, my research was quite conservative. Since Boyd was dead, obviously I couldn't interview him. So I relied on three main sources of material, existing books about the Boyd gang, original newspaper accounts, and CBC files. CBC TV had done some investigative work on Boyd right before he died and helpfully put all of their information online. Now, my assignment wasn't to write a long investigative book. Altitude wanted short accounts of interesting historical figures and events. I'm proud of the book that resulted uh, Edwin Alonzo Boyd, The Life and Crimes of Canada's Master Bank Robber. It was published in 2003 and was fairly successful. I went on to write several other books for Altitude, mostly in the true crime genre. For subsequent books for Altitude and for other publishers, I became much more adept at research. So by the time I was contacted by Ron Moffat to tell his story, I knew I couldn't just rely on secondhand sources to give him justice. Now, just a little background to explain. Uh, in 2012, independent Ontario publisher Five Rivers released a book I wrote about Stephen Truscott. Truscott was a 14-year-old boy convicted of murdering classmate Lynn Harper in 1959 in Clinton, Ontario. All the evidence was circumstantial, no matter. Truscott was the last person seen with Harper, so he was convicted and sentenced to hang. This was commuted to life in prison. He served 10 years, then was paroled. Journalists, however, kept investigating his case, pointing out the lack of physical evidence against Truscott and the presence of other suspects. In 1997, Truscott joined forces with the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted to clear his name. Because, you see, he was out of jail, but he still had a criminal record for murder. A legal campaign ensued, and in 2007, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal overturned Truscott's conviction and acquitted him. The Ontario government officially apologized and gave him compensation. In 2013, I received an email from a gentleman named Ronald Moffat, who had seen my Truscott book. Moffat said he had also been wrongfully convicted, of murder at age 14. The murder in question was seven-year-old Wayne Mallet, found strangled and dead on the grounds of the CNE on September 15, 1956. Mallet's family had been visiting Toronto when the little boy wandered off to the exhibition, which was closed at the time. It was a shocking crime for a city that still had a pretty squeaky clean image, Edwin Boyd aside. Police zeroed in on Ron Moffat, he had worked at the CNE and was familiar with the grounds. Also, he was a teenager 
and the main suspect, spotted by CNE guard, was a teenage boy riding a bicycle. Moffat had grown up in a poor neighborhood around Spadina and Queen Streets. He had the bad timing to run away from home shortly after Mallet's murder. Moffat took off because his father was mad at him for playing hooky from school. He gathered some clothes and snacks and squirreled himself into a hiding spot in his parents' apartment building at 39 Vanillae Street. Moffat's mother reported her son missing. Police investigated, found Moffat, and decided he was their prime suspect. They accused him of running away to escape punishment for Wayne Mallet's murder. Moffat was taken to the College Street Police Station and interrogated without a parent or lawyer present. One of the officers involved, interestingly enough, was Inspector Adolphus Payne, who uh, was a police legend who once arrested Edwin Alonzo Boy. In short order, Moffat confessed. Now, looking back, it's not hard to understand why. He was a terrified 14-year-old boy, peppered with questions, leading questions by hardened detectives. Moffat claimed they threatened him physically, although no one actually struck him. As I discovered later, false confessions, even to murder, are much more common than people think. Moffat was convicted and sent away, despite the fact there was almost no evidence against him except the confession. Now, the problem was Moffat didn't commit the crime, and this is touches on what Peter had just mentioned about the killer he wrote about. Wayne Mallet had been killed by Peter Woodcock. The sex offender and serial killer Peter Bronski wrote about. Woodcock, as Peter noted, went on to kill two more children before police finally clued in that maybe they'd arrested the wrong person in Wayne Mallet's murder. Moffat won an appeal, had a second trial, and was acquitted. He was looking for someone to tell his story. Now, while Truscott had been tried as an adult, Moffat had been tried as a juvenile, and what that meant was Moffat's name had been kept out of the newspapers. So people were familiar with the case, but not his name. He also wanted official recognition for his wrongful conviction. He never received an apology from authorities, much less compensation. So this was the story that had been presented to me by email. Now, quite a tale. I had to figure out if it was true or not. I emailed Moffat. I told him I was interested in his story, but I had to confirm things before committing to writing about him. So this is where modern technology comes in handy. I went to the Toronto Public Library website, entered my library card code, and clicked on the A to Z databases. Uh, the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star had digitized their archives, going back over a hundred years in the case of the Globe and Mail. You can pull up stories from like 1895 and get the whole story. There were plenty of front page articles about Mo Mallet's murder and Moffat's arrest. I also found lots of articles about Moffat's 1957 retrial and acquittal. And from what I could gather, Moffat had been released because A, his family hired a powerhouse lawyer named Patrick Hart, and B, the real killer, Peter Woodcock, was finally caught and testified on the stand that he had strangled Wayne Mallet himself at the CNE. Moffat told me his case had been cited in a couple books about Peter Woodcock, but no one had ever written a complete book about Ron Moffat. So I checked out the books in question, one of them on serial killers by Peter Bronski, another was by crime writer Mark Borey, Borey, I'm not 100% sure on the last, how to pronounce the last name. Both books backed what Moffat had said, that he had been railroaded into a forced confession for a crime he didn't commit. The research I did convinced me Moffat was telling the truth. Um, I told him I wanted to write a book about his case. My publisher at Five Rivers was interested. I knew I would have to do a huge amount of work, so I started doing a series of interviews with Moffat on in email, Skype, over the phone. He lived in Sault Ste. Marie, so it would be a while before we met in person. Now, huge problem already. The case happened so long ago that almost all of the players involved were dead, which meant Moffat was one of the only people I could interview who had first-hand knowledge of the case. So most of my book would be based on research, not interviews. Step one involved gathering additional newspaper coverage uh, from the Toronto Telegram, which ceased publication in 1971, 
among other papers. Telegram research I got right here in the reference library on microfiche. Um, I wanted to also get all the police and court files about the case, and I kind of naively thought this wouldn't be difficult to do and was totally wrong. I went to Toronto Police Station on College Street, the same one Moffat had been interrogated at, made a Freedom of Information request. I included as much detail on the form as possible. I said I wanted all police memos and documents from Inspector Payne and Detective Bernard Simons, who was also part of the Moffat investigation, and gave them exact time periods. I was assigned a researcher and given a research case number. I spoke to the researcher once on the phone, and after that, crickets. Um, I left weekly messages on their phone number before I decided the police were not going to cooperate. So I took another tack. I contacted the Archives of Ontario, and this is where older trial documents are stored. And the Archives said they would be happy to help, but they needed the transfer number, file number, schedule number, and temporary box number of any relevant court files, or at least one or two of those items. Again, I thought, no fear. I looked up the appropriate courthouses, because you're supposed to go to the courthouse where the trial had actually been held, to get this administrative information. And once again, I ran into a brick wall. I was informed several times by court clerks they couldn't possibly find this information. They had no master list of murder trials in Toronto from the 1950s. They couldn't help. So I bothered them with emails and phone calls, you know, because I couldn't believe they couldn't find this information. And they all said the same, no, can't find it, sorry. At one point, they told me to go to this big building on Jarvis Street where old court documents were stored in the basement. Um, I went there, I asked the clerks if they had any files from the 1950s, and they literally burst out laughing. They said, well, we got nothing older than the 70s. Tough one. Um, I went to a private company that specialized in tracking down Ontario court transcripts, and they couldn't help either. They said, we only deal with recent trials. So, I tried yet a different approach. I made freedom of information requests for documents with the Ontario Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. I included the titles of specific files from the York Judicial District Provincial Court System and York Crown Attorney's Office, and in all cases, the results were the same. No documents could be found. A request to the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario also resulted in a sorry, can't help you message. I contacted the CNE archives and was told they had no records at all of the Wayne Mallet murder. And this is where I discovered an interesting thing, and it kind of ties into what Peter had mentioned. Um, interesting fact about old court documents. Many of them don't exist anymore. Not everything makes it to the archives of Ontario. Now, even an average criminal trial will generate a huge amount of paperwork. And storing this paperwork takes up a lot of space. Now, you could put all of those documents on microfilm or microfiche, but that would be extremely expensive. So, typically, in the old days, what they would do is they would simply destroy these documents after a period of time, usually a few decades. Um, today, with digitization, it's far easier to retain these documents future reference. I'm not the first researcher to run into these problems. When investigators re-examined Stephen Truscott's murder conviction in the late 90s, they discovered that all physical evidence in the case that had been stored at the Center for Forensic Science had been thrown out years ago. Now, just to be clear, there's nothing conspiratorial about this. This is not some sort of George Orwell, you know, black hole of memory kind of thing. It's just a matter of making space new evidence or recent cases. Fortunately, I received a treasure trove of police documents about the Moffat case from a fellow crime writer. These were photocopied documents from the 1950s that had police memos, teletype messages, letters, wanted posters, autopsy results, judicial verdicts. The most valuable document was a copy of Ron Moffat's confession to police, which is right here, this is not the original, this is just a photocopy. These documents provided vital information that wasn't forthcoming from official channels. I also discovered that uh, Patrick Hart, Moffat's lawyer, was still alive, if rather ancient. Tracking him down proved difficult. 
We assume nowadays that everybody has a digital footprint and can be traced on Canada 411 or by Googling their email address. Not so much with old people. I contacted the alumni offices at Osgoode Hall Law School and the University of Western Ontario, where Hart had gone to school. They didn't have a clue where Hart was residing. They weren't even sure he had gone there, even though I had the information what year he attended. The Law Society of Upper Canada was equally oblivious. Finally, my research turned up something called the Office of the Chief Justice. They told me Mr. Hart was in a nursing home, and of course they wouldn't tell me where, and of course he didn't have email. The Office of the Chief Justice phoned the nursing home to relay my request for an interview. No response. The office forwarded a letter I wrote requesting an interview. No response. Fortunately, Hart's boss, Goldwyn Arthur Martin, had donated his files to the Law Society of Upper Canada Archives. I read these documents in person. They contained letters, speeches, and reports relating to the case. One of the more poignant items was a day planner with the word Moffat written on it in pencil for 1957. I felt a chill as I ran my fingers over these entries. Toronto crime historians have another very important venue for research, namely the Toronto Reference Library. This library contains a wealth of obscure documents, including a report to the Toronto Board of Commissioners of Police for 1956. This report was helpful for two reasons. Unlike a newspaper report, it mentioned Moffat's by name, and it also answered a nagging question that no one was able to answer. How many murders were committed in Toronto in 1956, the year that Ron Moffat was arrested? Sounds like a simple question. I approached Statistics Canada. Well, Statistics Canada mostly deals with national data. I emailed Statistics Canada, and they said, well, we don't have city-by-city city murder data from the 1950s. Hmm. Board of Commissioners report, however, offered precise tallies of, like, every possible crime that could have been committed in Toronto in 1956. To answer the question, there were nine murders that year. This very low crime rate was one reason police botched the investigation into Wayne Mallet. They simply didn't have a lot of experience dealing with murder of any kind, much less child killings. Toronto Reference Library also had reports from the Ontario Training School for Boys in Bowmanville, Ontario, and the Ontario Reformatory Guelph, which were two institutions Moffat was uh, housed at prior to acquittal. Some of these reports were actually written in handwriting. To draw things to a close, Mr. Moffat is now retired. As can be imagined, his life was a disaster after release. His parents were broke. They couldn't afford to launch a lawsuit for wrongful conviction. Moffat had psychiatric problems. He eventually got himself together. He worked as a custodian at a Sault Ste. Marie school, had a fulfilling life. He's currently married, has children, has grandchildren, and is very eager to get his story told, a story about an awful event in Toronto that happened six decades ago with repercussions right up to 2017. Now I'd be happy to turn the mic over to the next person in line. Thank you. Archives are very fragile. Uh, for example, um, I read in secondary sources and books that uh, we had slaves here in Toronto, and, and that the early, before the city was incorporated in 1834, we had, instead of a police, we had kind of a parish watch and a sheriff, and that they were involved in slave catching, and that in uh, the court records are records of slave arrests and transfer of slave, escaped slaves back to the largest slave owner in Toronto, uh, the Jarvis family, uh, from Jarvis Street is his name. So I was very eager to try to find those original from 1804, 1805, those original court records, and, and the author had, had seen them. Uh, and the book, of course, was written in the 1920s. So by the time I got to where those records would have been in the 1990s, I was told, oh, there was a big flood back in 1947, and all of Toronto's judicial records, uh, going back to the pioneer, pre, uh, you know, the, the, the Upper Canada era, were, were destroyed. So 
you know, nature, uh, the cost of real estate. You know, there's a race right now between how fast people can digitize material and how much it costs to keep material in paper on the shelf on very increasingly expensive real estate in this, in this city. So just for the cost of real estate, we're losing a lot of our, our history and our, our records. Um, next speaker I'll bring up is Lee Meller. Uh, Lee Meller is uh, maybe what, a couple of months short of uh, earning your PhD? Yeah, with, yeah. with any luck. With any luck, as they say. Uh, he's an investigative criminologist. He's the chair of the Academic Committee for American Investigative Society of Cold Cases, ASOC. Uh, as a criminal profiler, he has consulted with police on unsolved homicides in London, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Missouri. Uh, Lee is the author of uh, Cold North Killers, uh, Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder and Spree Killing. Uh, he's also the editor of some very heavy forensic textbooks, uh, Understanding Necrophilia, for which uh, I happily contributed a chapter on the history of necrophilia, uh, the Homicide Forensic Casebook, uh, and uh, Lee Miller as well is a publisher. Uh, he's the CEO of Grinning Man Press, which has been publishing Serial Killer Quarterly, which I know Robert has contributed articles to, as, 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 as well as I have. So, uh, let me bring up Lee Miller to talk about uh, his problems in writing criminal history. Thank you. Uh, Peter said we haven't had many serial killers in Toronto, and we were fortunate for that. I'm just curious, how many is many? I want to ask you guys. Uh, is five many? Is that more than you'd expect? What about six, seven, eight, nine? It's around ten. That's the actual truth, and about half of those are unsolved. One of them I came across, me and Peter were going through some of the, the re uh, records that he had recovered, and there was uh, two women with Slavic last names who had been uh, strangled, what was it, with stockings or something, something like that too, in the 1950s, just completely lost the history, and here's me and Peter going through these files, I'm like, dude, that's a serial killer. And he's like, yeah, yeah, just, lost. They didn't put two and two together at the time for the reasons that you've explained. Uh, so my own work, uh, as Peter said, there's the sort of uh, public um, happy Toronto, and then there's the dark side of Toronto, the Toronto Notorious. I went a little broader than that. I did that to Canada. So I think we'd all agree that we'd like to project an image of Canada as very friendly, welcoming, peaceful place, and compared to a lot of places in the world it is, and we're very fortunate to live here, but that doesn't mean that Canada itself does not have a real dark side to it. And for that reason, and other reasons I'll get to, I wrote this book, Cool North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder. Now in here is 60 cases of serial uh, killing, some solved, uh, some unsolved throughout uh, Canadian history, also involving some Americans who came to Canada to kill and some Canadians who killed in America. But the point is, uh, since then, I've had to, I've, I've come across about 100 cases of serial murder in Canada. And I just didn't have enough room in the book. Uh, the publisher cut me off just around 480 pages or something like that. It was just turning into a book this thick. So given the fact that there's about 380 victims who I've unearthed in this book to tell their tales, I, I have no time to do that sort of meticulous research that Peter and, and Nate did. As you can see, just the problems they have just getting information on one case to do it in detail. I was literally going through all these old newspapers looking for names of people that nobody even remembered existed. Just and I'll get to how I, I came to that place. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to also weave into this the idea, too, of not just how to research 
topics that are dark like this, but also how to process it, how to deal with it, how do you have the sort of personality that allows you to do this all day, every day, for, in the case of Cold North Killers, it was about three years. Three years of, of murder, 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 still going to this day. Uh, I'll start with, I'll start with the first little droplets of, of darkness in my life. So, my family moved here from uh, England when I was five years old, so this would have been around 1987. And we were living with an aunt in Scarborough around 1987-1988. Now, some of you, that might ring some bells. I was in kindergarten, and uh, there was a really nice man who noticed that me and my mother weren't really integrating with the other parents, and uh, he's a family friend to this day, his name's Pete. And he wanted to welcome us to Canada and kind of take us out of this isolation. So he came up, he introduced himself, shook my mom's hand. You know, I, I have a kid. Uh, I, these are my kids, they're in these class. And just a very friendly man. So I headed back to my aunt's place with my mom and my mom starts to tell my aunt about her day. And my aunt goes, oh my God, that man could be the Scarborough rapist. Now, imagine you're sitting there and you're five years old and you, you're picking up on the vibe of what that is, but you don't really know what a rapist is. But the way it's being talked about is there's something really sinister haunting these otherwise really boring suburbs. And that little droplet stayed with me. And I remember hearing the name Paul Bernardo, who the Scarborough rapist eventually turned out to be, serial killer um, responsible to, for the deaths of at least three uh, young females. And I remember hearing this all as I was growing up, and not really knowing the gravity of what had happened, but having a, a sense of it. And as I got older, being more and more interested in this topic. Now, when I went away to university, all that changed. Uh, I was in a band in, in Montreal, uh, doing, all, doing really well in history and university, kind of put all that dark stuff I was interested in behind me. And around 2009, I started to experience some really strange health problems that just came out of the blue. So I was having pain, numbness, tingling all over my body. And if you can imagine being around 25, 26 when this is happening and you have no reason to know why this is happening, it's, it's very scary. And uh, I was seeing myself kind of fall apart in front of my eyes and trying to deal with it psychologically. My grades started to go downhill. Um, realized that uh, the band I worked so hard at was not going anywhere. The, the girl I was with at the time broke up with me. Doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with me physically. And I was just spiraling down into a really dark place. And at some point around uh, 2000, mid-2009, I just decided to I uh, go back to Brighton, Ontario, where my folks live, and just recover and try and get to the bottom of what was happening. And I was just at a really low place in my life. And I think this is where I confronted my shadow. The, the shadow is a concept uh, that Carl Jung, uh, Sigmund Freud's disciple, has discussed. It's like uh, we all have this darker side of us, this kind of side that is interested in, in in death and transgression and this animal uh, brutality. The, the, the kind of worst parts of us that are naturally built into our genetics. And I was in such a bad place that I was just mired in my shadow. And it, it wasn't the kind of thing like, well, you know, if you go for a jog it'll, and smile a lot, it'll get better. I was, I was in a bit of a personal hell. So the only way I could deal with this was by going back to my old latent interest, which kind of reawoke in these um, serial murderers. And I think there was a part of me that felt like I had was a victim because I felt that there were things that were out of my control that were happening to me. I felt that the doctors uh, that I was working with I didn't actually 
care too much about what was happening to me, so I started to become paranoid, suspicious of people. And there was also a part of me that was very angry too, which kind of corresponded to more of the uh, offender side of it. You, you know, you start to start have some bad thoughts when you go deep. So what I decided to do was to keep hanging on there, try and get through this terrible state that I was in. And I've always been a writer uh, from my youngest years. And I decided, well, I'm going to take all this dark energy, this shadow that I'm living in right now, and I'm going to write a novel about an RCMP agent who's like a criminal profiler. And he goes all over Canada solving these serial homicides. And I thought, OK, sounds like a good idea. Canada's got a lot of different settings. I can make this work. I still want to make that idea work, by the way. But I had a thought. I went, what I don't want to do is to accidentally write a series of homicides that actually happened unknowingly and really destroy a family by, by, by writing a, a bestseller that um, accidentally uncovered a part of history I didn't know about, if you follow. Uh, so I said, well, I guess I'll have to find out what serial murders have happened in Canada. I said, okay, off the top of my head, we have Bernardo Amoka, Clifford Olson killed 11 children and teens of both sexes in British Columbia. And then there is, of course, Robert Picton, who's, he's been convicted of killing six women, but it's probably somewhere between 31 and 49, if not higher. And that's a whole other discussion we can get into there. But that was it. Three. Three. And I thought, that's not right. Something about human nature tells me there's more than three. And it's very curious that I know all of this about an American serial killer. And British serial killers, but I've never really freed for Canada. So, first thing, Wikipedia found about 10. Oh, interesting. Then I started to read about their cases. Okay, well, and gradually I started to lose interest in the novel and become more fascinated with this secret history of serial killing in Canada. And in the dark place, the shadow that I was in, I let myself just plunge right into it. 10 soon became 20, then 30, then 50, then it just got out of my control. It's like, I don't want there to be this many, because at this point I'm going to write a book about it, right? Like, I don't want there to be this many killers, this is way too much writing. And eventually it gets up to about 100. So, the result of that was, um, was Cold North Killers, which is really the first exhaustive book on serial murder in Canada, and it has about uh, six offenders from Toronto in here. So uh, I, I, me and my shadow merged. I fought through my bad place. I came out, a published author, started getting uh, contacted by academics. Wow, we're really interested in your work. And it's like, oh, I, all of a sudden I have a purpose again. I have a life. But, uh, and. And it was like I was the, the phoenix rising out of my, my own ashes, so to speak. And I, I was accepted into a PhD program. I didn't even have to do the master's because uh, having written this book, they said that that was master's level work. So I enrolled into a PhD program to specifically study um, serial murderers, uh, sex murderers, mass murderers, any kind of atypical homicide or sex crime. And I was doing really well, punched my way out of the dark place, renewed, and then around 2014, I get an email from a mass murderer who I had written about in book number two, Rampage. I can't tell you his name because this mass murderer filed a vexatious lawsuit against me. Now, this was all very confusing. I'm like, how, how do you file a lawsuit against me through email? Like, you have to deliver the papers to my door, right? I went and consulted with my publisher and their lawyer. They're like, uh, yeah, that's the way it's done. They can't just email you the papers. They have to bring it to your door. So I called the courthouse and I said, is this for real or is this a prank? And they looked up the, the file number like, no, it's real. Apparently, you can, you can file papers 
through email now. And I went, oh, great. So I looked at what the case was. <laughs> Completely frivolous. 35 different points. One of the accusations was that I referred to this man uh, as diminutive. And I said that he shuffled into an, an office. I'm just using language here to con convey an image in your mind so that you see things when you read instead of just being like, the man walked into the office, right? Um, he takes this as me attempting to portray him as a monster. This is one of the points in his 35-point lawsuit against me. Uh, this, ex this then goes on to extend such absurdities as, as clearly I should have known that it was a preemptive mass murder because, and that uh, plaintiff, that's how he referred to himself, had acted to save himself against an institution that was planning to kill him. So it's just madness. I'm looking at it going, how are you even legally allowed to file this lawsuit? Like, how does this get past anyone? And the point I want to hammer home is this person's incarcerated in a federal prison, and what this person was using the, uh, against me was basically your tax dollars, right? Because you guys are paying to house him, you're paying for his computer use, you're paying for his blocking up the courts, and, and for what? To, to absolutely frivolous points and to make my life worse and to make the publisher's life worse. So then I engaged in a battle with, uh, with that. It's like, okay, great, out of the frying pan into the fire. If I would have lost the lawsuit, I would have owed $200,000. And at that point, I was starting to think, I can think of some better ways to spend that money, my friend. Um, I'll let you, imaginations lead you where they will. Um, but I'm proud to, well, I'm proud to say, I'm very glad to say that about a month ago, uh, this vexatious litigant tapped out, meaning threw in the towel, and uh, so it didn't go to trial still at a great deal of personal expense to me and, and to you uh, as taxpayers. But the point being really that, first of all, I think this is, it's wrong. It's something that we should look into. But also that uh, when you're writing, you always run the risk that someone can sue you for basically nothing at all. Like, based on what I saw, he could have said, like, I'm suing him because he is a, a space alien and it can still go through the courts. That's how ridiculous it was. Now the reason this person who is considered a vexatious litigant was able to file this lawsuit against me was because I published the book in Toronto and he's only considered a vexatious litigant in the province of Quebec. And so I asked myself, if I had known that, would I have still written about him? Knowing that he would have put me through all this? And I think the answer is yes. I think sometimes you have to say, I, I will not be threatened out of telling the story of the, of the monster that you are. I will, I will not, I will not be, bow down to your threats. I will not cower to you like others have in the past. And so yes, I would do it again. Uh, so, where am I now? Um, in the period since uh, since Rampage and as this lawsuit's been going, and the, and the best thing to do when someone does something like this to you is they want to get inside your head, they want to haunt you, and they want you constantly thinking about them and how the, they may be destroying your life. And I just, I knew that because by that time I understood that psychology. And I, and I didn't let that happen. I basically forgot about it and just let the paperwork go through. So, how many times? Okay, so if, you, <laughs> if, uh, if there's one thing to take from this, uh, it's that writing crime sometimes is more than just research. It's being able to be comfortable with a dark side of yourself and being able to, to go to the, the limits of where your worst your worst thoughts can go into get inside the head of someone who's capable of atrocities and get right to the brink and then understand them 
and then be able to walk away without blinking. And I think I'll end it on that. Thank you so much. Words from the dark side. Um, and, you know, they say that about cops too, right? That every police officer is just a hair away from being a criminal. That it's the same kind of kind of mentality. Um, and, and, and you probably could say that about crime writers. Uh, you know, if we didn't write, I don't know where our energy would go. Into, into the places that the people we write about take their energy. And, and it's dangerous in a way, you know, in, in this kind of litigious society, you're writing about serial killers, you're writing about psychopaths uh, who are incarcerated. And the only thing they have to do is file a lawsuit. I mean, that to them is a day at the beach. Uh, and, 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 you know, Lee's story is, is, is a story that you often hear among true crime writers. Uh, how, you know, you somehow dissed the serial killer you wrote about, and they took it personally, uh, and the way they reach out to you is, you know, through the court system. They'll sue you. Uh, our last speaker, uh, Robert J. Wachowski. Uh, he's the author of Unsolved, True Canadian Code Cases. Uh, the author, Alice, shortlisted uh, The Last to Die. Ronald Turpin, author Lucas and the End of Capital Punishment. Uh, he's a former researcher, reporter at McLean's Magazine. He has contributed to top-rated television programs, including the Canadian version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Uh, his investigative work has been published in over 100 magazines and newspapers worldwide. And he's currently uh, an on-air consultant for an upcoming true crime TV series hours to kill. Uh, Robert has also written for, you begin to notice that we all write for each other. Uh, Robert as well has written for uh, Grinning Man Press and uh, I'm proud to say that I have a part in publishing Robert's next book uh, which has just come out last week. Uh, this was a book that my partner and I, R.J. Parker in Newfoundland, uh, decided to publish because no Toronto publisher in 40 years would publish an account of a crime that I think I'm looking at the age of everybody here in this room, all of us remember as probably the crime that changed Toronto forever, the murder of Emmanuel Jack, outraged. I present Robert James. coming tonight. It's very much appreciated. I'm just going to segue for one moment. This is off script here, but one thing I find interesting, and I don't know if the other three gentlemen here find this, uh, when it comes to writing about true crime and trying to keep the horrific aspects separate from your own personal life, I'm fortunate I have a wonderful wife named Liz who couldn't be here tonight, but she's definitely my rock in that regard. I use the word compartmentalized, and the reason I do that is because and this is a bit of an eerie similarity. Police and criminals themselves often will compartmentalize. They will take their thoughts and their feelings and separate that from their own personal life. And I don't know, this is actually a question that's going off here for a moment, but for the three of you, uh, I call it the ice cube tray theory, which sounds a bit silly, but most of the police I've interviewed over the years will do this. They will separate their crime work from their personal lives. And much like an ice cube, they will not allow the water, so to speak, their emotions to flow over from one tray to the next. How do the three of you deal with separating the emotion of what you're writing about from your day-to-day -day lives? Peter, what is your take on this? Well, you, you kind of, at a point, you have to switch off. There's, there's that, to say, as you say, you compartment. Your writing is in one place. Uh, what you're writing about is, is entirely another place altogether. Um, similar, yeah. 
similar process to what Peter and Robert both said. There's a bit of compartmentalization that goes on. Um, there's also the stuff I have written about often tends to have sort of a happy ending, for lack of better words. Like I've written about Stephen Truscott and now about Ron Moffat. And in both cases, these gentlemen went through hell. Uh, a terrible murder was involved, but you know, justice saw its way, I guess you could say, that both Truscott was acquitted and Moffat was acquitted. So that kind of helps, too, that there was sort of a sort of happy ending. I haven't actually written about too many serial killers, so I can't really go into detail about that. Uh, but definitely a compartmentalization that you don't let it, you know, get under your skin. And having been a journalist for several years, you know, prior to becoming an author, that definitely sort of gave me the training to do that. Thank you. I, I find interesting that you use the term ice tray. It reminded me of the serial killer Dennis Rader, also known as BTK, he called the cubing. So it's like a cube, he would he'd have the serial killer side of his life, and then he would sort of turn it around for the regular part of his life. Um, I thought I'm glad to hear that, or if I'm upset to hear that. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's, I'll, I'll one-up you and look like more of a psycho again. So uh, what I'd say is that I really, I don't separate my work from my life the same way that I'm really fully integrated with my shadow. This is really who I am. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example of some of the things that I've done, I watched that horrific uh, Luca Magnata video uh, for academic reasons and investigative reasons, I watched that about 10 to 15 times, frame by frame. So, the way that I am able to do this is that I know that I'm not a bad person. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just telling you that I'm confident in myself that there's no slipping. And if I have the capacity to use this integration with my shadow, to help solve crimes, which I, I do do as a criminal profiler through ASOC. I'd like to do it in Canada too, if there's any cops listening. And if I can use it for something good, then that's my use. That's my role in the society as a person, is to be uh, the person who, who wades into the psychological darkness and fights it uh, with my own variation. I don't know, kind of like uh, Batman, but with a worse diet and poor things. <laughs> thank you. I was wondering that for a while. I'm glad we got that out. Thank you. Uh, Segwing here from that to Psychopaths for just a moment. Uh, I had a completely different introduction plan for this, but I could not miss one opportunity. Uh, this week saw the death of one of the most notorious master manipulators of all time, Charles Manson. And just for a moment, I'd like to read off some names. Stephen Parent, Jay Seabrick, Gary Hinman, Wojciech Fukowski, Abigail Folger, Lena LaBianca, Rosemary LaBianca, Donald Shea, Sharon Tate, and her unborn son, Richard. These are the victims of Manson's so-called family. They deserve to be remembered. He does not. It's maybe a bit of a strange thing coming from someone writing about true crime, but I feel quite passionate about this because I've interviewed the victims over the years have interviewed their families, and this type of emotion does get, definitely get to you. So you may be asking yourselves, what does this have to do with the theme of Toronto crime as local history and <laughs> historical crime books? And actually, it has a great deal to do with it. As a society, we tend to focus more on the killers than their victims. And here in Canada, for example, these names may not mean much to a great deal of you, but to people here, it, it, they might. Uh, Christine Weller, Judy Cosman, and Terry Lynn Carson. These are just three of the 11 murderers attributed to Canadian serial killer Clifford Olson. And like Manson, the names of these victims deserve to be remembered. Clifford Olson does not. I just wanted to get that out of the way, and I thank you for indulging me for a moment. When it is well written and well researched, true crime is about a great deal more than murder, abductions, bank robbers, and missing persons. It is about victims, who these people were, who they knew, who they loved. It is about family, the ones left behind, and how they cope with such devastating loss. And it is about the strength it takes to somehow keep on living after the life of your son, daughter, wife, or husband was stolen from you forever. 
I am pleased to be here tonight with three of the finest true crime authors Canada has to offer. Nate Henley's many books, as we know, include the story of Irish immigrants to Black Donnelly's, a tale going back all the way to the 1880s. Peter Vronsky's work meticulously details serial killers from the past to the present, and Lee Meller's books Rampage and Cold North Killers explore the darkest corners of society, Canadian society, and I am honored to be here with you three gentlemen tonight. Before I get into my most recent book about the murder of Shushan Boy Emmanuel Jacks, I'd like to share for a moment a bit of advice I received years ago from Peter C. Newman. With a career going back many decades, Peter has known and interviewed practically every Prime Minister since the 1950s, has published thousands of magazine articles, and by my last count, 34 books, including biographies on John Diefenbaker and the secret Mulroney tapes, Unguarded Confessions of a Prime Minister. He got into trouble for that one. Years ago, while working at McLean's magazine, Peter generously offered, through no suggestion of my own, he actually approached me about this, to write the foreword to my book, The Last to Die, which is about the hangings of Arthur Lucas and Ronald Turpin, which took place, some people may not realize, not far from here, actually, at the old Don Jail at Gerard and Broadview. It was back in 1962. While writing my book, Peter said, to always remember you are writing about someone's life and times. That really resonated with me, especially the part life and times. As true crime writers, we have a tremendous responsibility to not only pay respect to the crimes we're writing about, but to the victims and their families, be they an immigrant kid from Portugal making a few bucks shining shoes on Young Street, or in one of my books, a socialite murdered in a very expensive Yorkville apartment. These people were all someone's child, sister, brother, parent. We have an obligation to do our best to capture the feelings of the times of which we write, be they in rural Ontario over 100 years ago, or Toronto in the disco era of the 1970s. I've written three books. One of the criticisms I received from readers regarding my second book, Unsolved, True Canadian Cold Cases, was the fact they felt some cases, which they believed should have been in Unsolved, were omitted. In fact, I received an email from a reader about this just a few days ago. While researching Unsolved, I quickly realized, realized excuse me, that across Canada, there are literally thousands of unsolved murders, abductions, and missing persons cases. The Toronto Police, in fact, has a great web page devoted to homicide cold cases from 1959 to the present and there are literally hundreds of cases on their site. While well, there have been tremendous advances in science and technology over the years, most notably DNA, going back to 1986, the work of police officers, detectives, and experts is only as good as the evidence they're able to uncover. The ability to solve unsolved crimes depends on many factors. And according to Toronto Police, since 1996, through new opportunities and investigative techniques, and advancements in scientific methods, cold case investigators have had success solving cases through the re-examination of old evidence. As we've heard earlier today, a lot of that depends on whether or not the evidence actually still exists. Despite forensic evidence, it is still important for investigators to hear from the public about who may have information about past homicides. Just before I get into the uh, unsolved book, I'm going to go over my second book for just a moment. One of the cases I wrote about in Unsolved was a 1973 double homicide of Wendy Tedford and Donna Stern. Both girls were just 17 year olds at the time, and they were found in an empty lot near Wilson Avenue and Keel Street by a student taking a shortcut. Both girls had been shot at close range, and immediately police do what police do best, which is set about retracing the girls' final hours who they were with, what they were doing, and establishing a timeline which is critical to every police homicide investigation. The murders of Tedford and Stern were by no means isolated. Just a few years earlier in 1971, two other girls, Lee Rita Kirk, 15, and Catherine Edith Potter, just 13, were found dead in a gravel pit in Pickering. To police, it appeared the girls had been killed somewhere else before being dumped in the pit. Writing about these types of crimes makes one realize just how wide-ranging the spectrum is when it comes to victimology. 
As both girls were wards of society and living in group homes, their biological parents were not informed that their own children were dead. Instead, they had to hear about the murders over the radio, not from police. In one case, unable to pay for the funeral, one of the mothers had to apply for money under what was then called the Compensation for Victims of Crime Act and received exactly $902, which was enough just to pay for her daughter's funeral. And it's details like this that make writing about true crime sometimes very difficult to process. Another case around the same time was the disappearance of Ingrid Bauer in Kleinberg in 1972. And much like the disappearance years later of Nicole Moran, 14-year-old Bauer vanished literally without a trace. In many cases, there's always some sort of physical evidence left behind, clothing, shoe, strand of hair, things like that. Yet in the Bauer case, no clothing or personal effects were ever found. For my book, I interviewed her brother, who said his sister was a good student, had a boyfriend, didn't drink or smoke, and had a stable home life. In short, she had no reason to run away, let alone disappear. Despite searches for the girl, including ravines, forests, and rivers, along with extensive press coverage, highway billboards with her photo and description of what she was last seen wearing, 1,400 tips came into police. Yet 45 years later, she still remains missing. And while this case remains open, for me, one of the saddest details was a statement her brother made to me who said, very matter-of-factly, he doubts her remains will ever be found since what was once forested and farmland surrounding the home has been turned into massive housing projects. As a true crime writer, one of the questions I get most often is, what is it like interviewing family members of missing and murdered persons? And that depends widely on the family. In some cases, they choose to talk to me. In others, they do not. I respect the decision I preferred that they do talk to me, but sometimes I understand the grief is just too insurmountable for them to address. I'll reach out to them and sometimes it isn't unusual to hear literally nothing for weeks or months and then I receive a call out of nowhere agreeing to an interview. As writers, we never stop learning. We never stop learning about ourselves, we never stop learning about the cases we cover and the people we interview. No matter how much I'd like to think I know, there was always a great deal more to uncover. And this proved especially true in the case with my most recent book, Outraged, The Murder of Shushan Boy, Emmanuel Jacks. This past July, it was 40 years since he went missing. And four decades after his death, his name still remains synonymous with one of the most horrific crimes in Canadian history. Go into Google. And just type in the words Shushan Boy, you don't even have to put it in parentheses. The first page is nothing but Emmanuel Jacks. And you'll see links to articles, many of them referring to how his death changed the face of Young Street, which is absolutely, unquestionably true. To gain some appreciation into the magnitude of the murder, one has to realize what Toronto was like before Emmanuel's death in 1977. As I believe was Peter mentioned earlier, the expression, Toronto the good. I'm sure a lot of people here have heard it, but they may not know where it came from. It was actually a phrase coined by William Holmes Howland, who was mayor of Toronto way back in 1886 to 1887, which was not a very long time, but the phrase stuck around much longer than he did. He came up with Toronto the good as part of a campaign into the city's religion and morality. And interestingly enough, one of his initiatives was hiring a police inspector to combat vice and prostitution in Toronto. Fast forward almost 100 years to 1977. For people here who are old enough to remember it, Toronto solicited very many different opinions back then compared to now. Um, basically, Toronto the good, depending on who you ask, was anything but good. There were slogans at the time, some people may remember, Young Street is Fun Street. There were arcades, there were porno shops, there were pinball places, there were bars. The area basically known as the Strip, which I cover in my book, ran on Young Street, primarily on the east side from Girard in the north, all the way down to Queen in the south. And indeed, this was overrun with porno theaters, sex shops, and body rubs, the majority of them being illegal. Despite efforts to clean up the sex trade over the years, 
There were experiments such as the Young Street Mall in the early 1970s, yet these basically failed to have any effect on changing the uh, face of the street. Illegal massage pros would appear and disappear much to the dismay of so-called legitimate business owners. As I know we're going a little bit over time, but I'll just wrap up here in a moment. To give some context of just how bad it was, from the period 1971 to 72, there were 16 sex shops on Young Street. By 1973, there were 36. And by 1973 as well, there were 83 body rubs, and the numbers just kept growing and growing and growing. I had a great interview this morning with a uh, lovely local reporter from uh, Beaches newspaper. And she asked a young girl, just in her 20s, and she asked what some of the opinions were people had at Young Street in the 70s. And for me, it fell basically into three camps. One, you were young and embraced it. Two, you hated it and made your opinion very publicly known. Or three, which is what most people in Toronto did, you just ignored Young Street, turned on your blinders and kept walking. It was against this backdrop of porno theaters, dirty bookshops, and body rubs that 12-year-old Portuguese immigrant Emmanuel Jacks was out shining shoes simply to make a few dollars. He was not alone that day, as he was with his brother and friend, and in fact there were many other kids out shining shoes that July afternoon back in 1977. Although there were laws about children being prohibited from working after, after certain hours on the street, it was still relatively early. And this to me is still just very emotional because, and I'll tell you why in a moment, the most disturbing aspect to me of the case is how he was lured away to his death during daylight hours, and as Peter knows, actually, one of the initial working titles for my book was Monsters in Daylight, because they were indeed monsters and he was abducted in daylight hours. On the pretext of being offered $35 an hour to move some camera equipment, Emmanuel remained behind on the street with a strange man for just a few minutes while his brother and his friend went to a nearby payphone to call their mothers to ask for permission to go with the man to make a few dollars. Their mothers adamantly said no. This is how quickly this all happened. They went around the corner of Young and Dundas to payphone outside a restaurant. They came back and for me, again, one of the most upsetting things was people, especially the press report over the years that Emmanuel had disappeared. He actually hadn't disappeared. His brother and friend could see him through the crowd walking away with this man and they were unable to catch up to him. So they literally saw him as he walked to what would end up being his death. Emmanuel was not the first boy to have been enticed on the promise of earning money, as others had also been sexually assaulted in a rundown apartment above Charlie's Angels, a Young Street body rub right across the street from the brand new, at the time, Eaton Center. And although there was a similar murder four years earlier, very, very similar, of a young boy named Kirkland Deasley. Some of you may remember this place. It was called the Ford Hotel. It was located where the atrium on Bay now stands. The death of nine-year-old Kirkland did not fuel the type of rage Toronto felt after Emmanuel's death, which inherently gave the city permission, as it were, to finally clean up, <clears throat> excuse me, what mayor at the time, David Crombie, famously called the yawning cesspool known as Young Street. And tragically, it took his death to finally bring about changes to the strip. Four men were charged with his murder, three were convicted, and one was found not guilty, much to the outrage of the police, who made their opinions very publicly known and who were chastised for it, the public and members of, uh, of the press at the time. I know I said I wouldn't, but I will mention Charles Manson one last time, and here's why. The murders committed by his followers signaled the end of the free love and hippie era of the 1960s. And in many ways, perhaps on a bit of a smaller scale, but in many ways, the murder of Emmanuel Jacks marked the end of Young Street of the 1970s. Cleanup efforts to close body rubs were swift, brutal, and extremely effective. One of the people I interviewed for my book uh, was Paul Godfrey, who was Metro Chairman at the time. He said that after the murder, the city had no alternative but to act. And Godfrey's words, doing nothing was the worst alternative out of everything. This 40 years later, he still remembers it quite vividly. He also uh, attended Emmanuel's funeral. And he had young children of his own at the time. 
According to Godfrey, Young Street had become a den of prostitution in the downtown core. There was no doubt that the boy's capturing and murder really exposed the horrors of Young Street. It was not where you'd want families to go to visit. It was not where residents and the adjoining areas enjoyed being. And we, as elected representatives of the city, didn't have to be told that something drastic had to take place. Once we saw what had happened, there was no issue that was more important than the resolution of what had become of Young Street. The killing of young Emmanuel Jacks was the last straw to taking aggressive action to making something positive happen to change the face of the city. There's many aspects in the book, which I have copies of here, which I, I hope you read and I'd like to see comments about. I appreciate all, all comments and reviews. And uh, for me, one of the challenges of trying to distill a book of almost 350 pages into this talk of 15 minutes that has proven quite, uh, quite interesting. And I'll just leave you with one final passage for now from my book. The murder of the shoeshine boy changed Toronto in every way imaginable. Legally, politically, morally, socially, economically, criminally, sexually, and even aesthetically. Many of Young Street's businesses got a facelift in the years after Emmanuel was killed, while others were demolished and rebuilt. In fact, just a few years ago, the uh, body rub at 245 where he was uh, killed was finally demolished. The city's sex industry, at least the way the sex industry was at the time, is gone. Every few years, particularly around the anniversary of his death, Emmanuel's name makes the news. A grim reminder of Toronto's past, but also an insight into what would become the future of the city. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Robert. Um, I guess at this point we'll maybe open up questions. Anybody wants to come up to the microphone and ask any one of us. Yes. I grew up in Windsor and Bob Cribbs down, I mean, Bob Cribbs, I grew up next door to Bob Cribbs. He was my next door neighbor. And you know, I felt bad for the parents and Windsor was never the same after that. You know, when I read bits and pieces of, in the paper, whatever happened to the Jacks family? Thank you. And I shared that with you before. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, the family, interesting you ask, because Peter and I were at a uh, discussion hosted by the Portuguese community back in July, uh -huh. and that was one of the first questions people asked is, what, Where happened, are, what, happened, to what happened to them? Uh, there were more children than Emmanuel. Yeah, I knew His that. older I brother, knew, yes, I knew that. who was with him, and friend, yes, and uh, basically they went, there were fundraising efforts at the time, including one by Mel Lastman, former mayor, to uh, raise money. Some airlines had donated funds to have the family go to Portugal for a vacation, which to my understanding they did. And after that, they basically disappeared, except for a number of years ago when one of the killers came up for parole. Yes, I read that. Yes, and at the time, then Emmanuel's sister actually came forward and she quite understandably spoke out against him getting out. See, I saw the picture of Bob Cribbs right there. I looked on the internet. I don't remember him like that. You know, I remember him as a young kid, well, coming out of Bo like somebody mentioned the word Bowmanville. That's where he was. Originally he was in Bowmanville. Yes. Oh, that's that's where I grew up. Bowmanville. Bowmanville. Yeah. Bowmanville. That's where he was. You know, he was constantly like he'd come back home and then he'd be gone again. But the the murder it it shattered Windsor. It literally shattered the city of Windsor. I didn't. I didn't know that. Actually. Oh, it, it shattered us because you know why? We were. We were. It was a community that we never saw would ever happen, and it shattered the Bob Cribb's parents. They were never the same. Thank you for that information. Robert, I heard the, the Emmanuel Jack killers weren't they killed in prison? Uh, no, actually, one of them did die behind bars. Uh, the other three are very much alive, and I don't want to say someone's particularly alive, but uh, the man who was dubbed the ringleader, the one who lured Emmanuel away, Saul David Batesh, he keeps popping up in the news over and over. 
He was actually in the uh, news back in, I believe it was February, and he was in the news a few years earlier because he's on an online website looking for pen pals. And uh, the Toronto Sun actually had a very interesting line saying that considering what he did, he'll probably get the type of pen pals he deserves. Yeah. No, he died of natural causes actually. Yeah, but the other, the other, the other two are still alive. So three were actually uh, convicted, and one was let go. And there was a, quite a controversy about that because the police served him in Greece afterwards. He had fled to Greece, and uh, he was actually there was no no subsequent uh, conviction of him. There is, if you understand necrophilia as a, a wider concept, okay, so I'll, I'll define this for you and I'll try and not cross the gross lines very hard for me guys, please be patient. So uh, necros in Greek means the corpse, the body, not death, and uh, philia is the love of, it really should be lania, that's sexual desire, but then we'd have to change pedophilia to pedalania, someone screwed up down the line, anyways. So really, um, this idea of, uh, of necrophilia, it doesn't have to involve <laughs> what we would consider um, intercourse with a corpse. It's really anything that gets you off necessitating a corpse. So if you think of some, someone like Jack the Ripper, there was no intercourse there, but there was mutilation of the corpse and the extensive taking of, of parts out, right? Even uh, offenders who just pose corpses and take photographs of them and dress them up. So it is actually um, much more widely represented among serial killers uh, than most people believe it is when you understand it at that level. Now, what would account for that? There's a, a psychoanalytic uh, analytic theory that I quite like, and it's this idea that there are people who have a certain personality that makes them unable to accept that life is full of risk. Okay, so whenever we enter a, a relationship, or um, whether it's you know romantic or, or business, or whenever we get up on stage and, and speak to a crowd about necrophilia, something like that, right? There's always a risk that it's going to go wrong, that something bad is going to happen. But a healthy person accepts that life is full of risks, and they're able to live with that and grow. Now, serial killers and their like are pathologically unable to deal with things being out of their control. And that can extend to romantic partners. So if you think of uh, a serial killer who ties up his victims, usually a kind of sadist or sadistic rapist, that, in a way, I mean, it serves a pragmatic function of them not escaping, but sometimes they can't escape anyways, but they'll still tie them up. I've even heard of serial killers tying up the corpse, right, to mirror a fantasy image. And that is about um, minimizing the risk of the person having their own agency and, and free will. If you look at necrophilia as kind of further sliding down that scale, that person can't even accept the risk of the... Of the item of desire, object of desire being tied up and alive, they need it dead to feel totally secure around it. Uh, and then you can go even further into cannibalism where it's like, I you know, literally have to take pieces of it and ingest it into, in me to make it a part of me. So if there's a correlation between necrophilia and, 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 and serial killing, as you've said, I would say it's got to be along those lines. Sorry, good evening gentlemen, thank you. Uh, just a quick one, I won't keep you long, I'm doing an Australian job by the way. Um, the Peter Woodcock uh, issue, um, 1991, uh, he basically went to, apparently was given a, a unreserved pass for the first time issued in 34 years. Um, I just didn't get the clarification if that, uh, because obviously another murder occurred, was he given extra jail time in the period of, uh, or rather for the murder that occurred when he was actually out 
on the, uh, the free time. Well, he wasn't actually. He wasn't. Uh... <laughs> check, check, check. He wasn't actually jailed. Um, when you're uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity, you're indefinitely confined. Uh, so he, I, I, you know, he, he was like a, a play like penitentiary and put in the insane asylum, as they used to call the institution. Um, it's not a jail. You've committed a crime, but you've never been criminally convicted of it. So the rules are different. Um, if theoretically, the way it works, um, the way it should work, is if they cure you, um, or if they you, you recovered from it, you might go to trial then for it, because now you're capable of defending yourself, certainly in the American law. But essentially, to be found insane criminally, you have to be unaware of what you're doing. Um, and of course, we never considered, you know, we didn't even have that term, serial killer, until 1981, becomes kind of a publicly used term. So certainly in the 1950s, he was just seen as insane. Um, you know, it wasn't that he was given uh, a pass to go out by himself. He actually was given a pass with another person who was supposed to escort him. But that person himself was a convicted murderer. Uh, who is now working as a security guard. Uh, you know, it's, so it gets even crazier. Uh, you know, the story of Peter Woodcock is a story inside a story inside a story. It just keeps on going. Right? Um, so, so there was no extra time added because there was no time to add. He was just returned and, and they didn't give him another day pass. Okay. Thanks. I think what's interesting too is when we look at it now, it's like he wasn't insane. Uh, judging by Absolutely. everything I've learned, yeah. he was just a psychopath. Yeah. And one of the ways that they had, they treated him at this institution is uh, they had all these crazy ideas in the 60s about bonding, and they, they tied him up to another inmate. So imagine being tied to a serial killer, and then just like given all this LSD, and he's given this LSD, and they thought that that would be a, a good treatment. You've got to remember that Woodcock went through several generations of psychiatric therapy as, as they realized decade after decade treating this guy, oh, actually this stuff we're doing to him is making him worse. Uh, you know, there were all sorts of kooky psychiatric theories in the 60s, uh, so he was subjected to them all. And Woodcock had... Let's go, let's go. It's no, it's on. It's on. You said it's gone. Woodcock had uh, gone through all sorts of therapy as a young boy. He was adopted uh, by, or sorry, he was not adopted, he was brought in as a foster child to a fairly well-to-do family in Toronto. And they constantly tried to reach out to him. He was in like institutions for varying periods of time. He went to psychotherapists, he went to counselors, and he still was this bizarre kid who really didn't have any friends. Uh, who rode around the city on his bike all, in all weather, fantasizing about having a gang. And he just sort of turned to, he, well, he started molesting children and then went from that to killing children. Um, but his entire life had been sort of an act. Of, he was in therapy almost from, you know, the time he could walk practically. And they could never really figure out, Mark Borey, who we, we referenced here, interviewed him several times. Um, when he was institutionalized, and he said he could never come up with a convincing reason why he killed four people. And he could never, Mark could never really figure out what exactly was wrong with the guy. Like, a, you know, probably sociopathic, psychopathic, but, you know, it's very hard to put a finger on exactly what was going on inside his head. My question is actually uh, just an extension of that, and I'm wondering, like, if you guys, like, since you have worked on all these criminal cases, uh, these uh, uh, deviant minds, and like, just to give me a window into like, how exactly do they rationalize it? Uh, you guys refer to it like ice cube, or they compartmentalize it, do they just totally forget about it, or do, do they justify it? Um, how, because like for others, or like people like who, who are even soldiers, if they see something traumatic, it haunts them through the life. And these people go in and they commit these crimes and looks like does nothing to their psyche. They're like, so 
there must be somehow justifying it in their minds. Well, you know, that's a question that people ask often serial killers. Um, you know, what did it feel like when you were doing this? And, and the inevitable answer from almost every serial killer who's asked that question is, I felt nothing. And that's what makes them psychopaths. They feel nothing. Right? They feel no joy. They feel no uh, pain. They feel no remorse. They feel no pity, no empathy. They just feel nothing other than the need to control um, and to extend control over their, their victim. And often, indeed, they'll blame the victim. A lot of these offenders will construct a kind of scenario where the victim led them to kill them. You can also sometimes overanalyze the reasons you know, why somebody does something. I wrote a book about Bonnie and Clyde, who, um, by the way, were much scummier than the portrayal in the 1967 movie, and not nearly as good looking as Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. Um, and my conclusion was that they committed a lot of these crimes, well, Clyde committed most of the actual murders, and he, did, he was just too lazy to work. And he thought stealing was easier, and people got in the way when he stole, so he shot them. And police started coming after them, so he just shot them too. Like he didn't really give it a lot of thought. And he kind of, he liked fast cars, and he liked browning automatic rifles, and that was about the extent of his, you know, interest. And, and Bonnie kind of went along with it just because she was living in a small town as a waitress and was really bored, and this was kind of exciting. But, you know, there was no grandiose reason why they did this stuff. Um, and just to sort of segue briefly, I uh, thought Robert's presentation is very uh, poignant. Uh, another reason I like being a true crime writer is you can reveal a bit of the truth. And the truth on the Pony and Clyde example was that they'd been romanticized to death. They were not a romantic couple. They lived like bums. They were not good looking, and they mostly robbed grocery stores and gas stations, not banks. So it was very nice. It was a good feeling on my part to be able to write the truth about that and say that these guys were not the glamorous criminals that were depicted in the movie. So. They do sometimes uh, feel sexual gratification of an extremely deviant nature. Um, Things that you would look at and you'd say there's nothing sexual about that at all could be intensely uh, sexually stimulating to, uh, to a serial killer or a lust murderer. And that often comes up from a childhood fantasy. And if you can think about your own sexual development, you, you know, you have certain fantasies and then, you know, in most cases it's followed by masturbation and such, and it's just a healthy arc unless those fantasies are the revenge fantasies against your mother where you cut her head off, right? And then by the time you get to the point where you're masturbating, all of a sudden that is what gets you off, not lingerie or, you know, a, a, a nice body. It's literally that. And so I know that sounds really hard to wrap your head around, but if you just think of like if your fundamental fantasies and, and, and that you had um, were always of a violent nature and then your sexuality grew up through those fantasies, then the acts that they commit, uh, no matter how heinous or just violent they look, can actually be acts of, of sexual pleasure. Hi. Um, my uh, question is for Mr. Wyszlowski. I want to compliment you on the first book called The Jock Murder. Uh, my question is, um, I understand the Jock family have been out of the public eye since their loss, and that Mr. Jock has passed away. But were you able to um, interview any of the family members, or even any member, any of the survivors of the four? I wasn't able to interview any of the family members. Um, a number of years ago, I had a detective who was actually since passed at Toronto Police Headquarters uh, reach out to them on my behalf. It took quite a while for him to contact them, and their response to him was, while they do not object to a book on their son, they do not wish to participate at this time. Those are the exact words. 
Um, interesting question you have about the other, so by the four, you mean the four who were involved in the murder? Uh, there was like surviving victims like uh, David, oh. Mark, oh, Garnett, yes. so, okay. uh, there, there were, but I basically left it at changing their names in some cases in the book, rather than pursuing that. I'll just give a little background about what the gentleman saying. Uh, the, f the three of them, well actually the four, technically of the in men involved in the case, the uh, guilty individuals, three were convicted and one was found not guilty, had done this before. They had lured young boys back to the apartment and molested them and photographed them in various stages of undress. And what happened was they started taking pictures of kids and getting involved with kids who were younger and younger. So this went down where this, this scale of like teenagers to nine, eight, seven year olds, it was horrific. Um, a number of boys were found by police through really good police work on behalf of Toronto officers. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very involved case, but I'll just, I'll just get into it for a moment. Saul Batesh, who was seen as a regulator, went to, with an attorney, went to Toronto police and confessed. They didn't know if he was actually telling the truth or not. His story was so outrageous. The other three had fled on the train to Vancouver and they were caught part way. In their luggage were photographs of young boys in various stages of undress or completely naked. And police were able to track down those boys who were subsequently called to the trial in 1978. And in my book, out of respect for them, I only use first names and I didn't actually pursue. There were chances where I had to pursue a few of them, but I figured it was just too upsetting. So I based that on the uh, court transcripts in that case, rather than actually talking to them. As some of them were, they were extremely young. I mean, we're talking about 10 year old kids. And you know, the book's upsetting enough as it is for some people to resurrect the memory of what happened. And I figured I'd just leave that part alone. Hi, hi Robert, thank you for your good work. Um, I met briefly Manuel many times during the summertime. Um, my cousins and I would go to the movies and we're waiting you know, to get into a movie, I can't even remember the movie, uh, you know, G rated or PG. And off to the side I noticed Manuel, and he was of course doing what he does. He was shining shoes and um, took the time to speak with him. Great kid, great kid, and uh, I think there should be at least one chapter, if it's possible, to write about Manuel Jacques outside the murder, the kind of good kid he was. He was saying that he would save his money, give it to his parents faithfully, and uh, I admired that. I admired that a lot. Uh, one question I did have is um, to clean up Young Street, and I remember I'm a Toronto person, I've been living in Toronto all my life, and it was extremely, extremely dirty, unbelievably dirty, and you can't have that kind of environment without, and I have to say this at least once, organized crime. So how can you close so many triple um, X stripper places and butter off places without having a few officers arrested? It's a very, very good question, actually. There were stories about organized crime being involved in Toronto at the time, mainly from the States, and they were involved in, believe it or not, pinball arcades, which used to be, the Young Street used to be full of these places. Much to my mother's dismay, I would go and spend $10 on a roll of quarters, like I'm sure a lot of people here. My cousin is here today, I'm sure he probably did the same thing actually. And my mother would be like, what did you spend your money on? And Ten bucks on this. They were involved in that, they were involved in the porno industry, they were involved in, in strippers. Whether a number of them got arrested, I'm not exactly certain. What led to the cleanup was, as I mentioned in my talk, was a number of politicians. It was Art Eggleton at the time, Paul Godfrey, Mayor Crombie, and some who were still involved in lawmaking including one fellow named George Rusty, who's a very well-known Toronto uh, solicitor. There were laws on the books to close these places for years, and as George told me quite astutely, he said, there's no point in having laws if the police aren't going to enforce them. 
So there was a little bit of a blame game on both sides who was involved in actually shuttering these places down. And an attorney who's still practicing, a lovely man by the name of Morris Manning. You may have heard of Morris. He actually was involved in the uh, Scientology raids on Young Street years ago. He represented the strip, uh, strip Association, the sex industry on their side. He was the attorney for um, Henry Morgenthaler. Very, very well-known man. He was brought in as the heavy gun to bring in these laws. And because he had such a depth of knowledge of having worked in uh, the political sphere as well for the provincial solicitor's office, he was able to bring up something called the Padlock Law, which goes back to World War II. And if any word fits draconian, it's the Padlock Law. What he was able to do was to have police enforce this law. Any place that had been found, there's, there's a lot of minutiae in the book about it, but in essence, any place that had been found guilty of knowingly or unknowingly having an illegal body room could be closed by police for a period of one year. And I remember asking Morris about this, and I said, well, what do you mean by closed? He said they'd come and they'd slap a padlock on it. I said, what if there was a broken pipe or rats infested? He said they didn't give a shit. <laughs> and literally, pardon my vulgarity, they didn't give a shit. Owners of these body room premises, some, as I mentioned, knew that the place was rented out to the sex industry, some didn't. They flipped out because they were not only losing rent, significant amounts of money, but also their places were going to hell. Like they were literally, imagine if you locked your house for a year yeah. and you know, you left your, your stove on and your fridge full of food, you know, come back 365 <laughs> days later. So that was basically, the, in essence, the law. They were allowed to close these places. And at one point, Young Street had almost 150 illegal body rubs. I remember that. Yeah, they were everywhere. And part of the reason, sorry, I won't take up too much more time. Part of the reason they were on the second floors, which is an interesting factoid, is because to uh, commercial businesses, the main floors weren't that attractive. You know, you, I mean, sorry, but rather they were attractive. You know, you'd have visibility. Second floors weren't. So who would want to rent these places? Who could afford it? The sex industry. So these body rubs would pop up, they'd stay open in some cases for a few weeks or months. And before the police bylaw officers could come by, they'd close down on their own and they'd move somewhere else. To be quite honest with you, uh, even as a young kid, many will died at the age of 12. And when I met him, was about uh, roughly two weeks before he did die, or he was missing. And the feeling on the street, even as a young person myself and my cousins, is that the cops were as, as bad as the criminals themselves. You know, there was this feeling that we don't want to talk to a cop. They're as dirty as anyone else. So that's how bad it was, and I was only 13 at the time. So we're, we're the same age, actually. I was just yeah. a few months older than Emmanuel when he died. Yeah. yeah so. A great kid, and everyone should remember what it took to clean up Young Street. It's a real shame. Toronto should be embarrassed, even to this day, that it took the death of a really innocent kid who just wanted to help his parents, and he died. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Other other municipalities have done similar kind of cleanups. New York City cleaned up Times Square, which is a notorious kind of rat stand. And I could be mistaken, um, cities have often relied on quite imaginative laws to do some of these cleanups. And I could be wrong, but I think it was New York City that passed a municipal law that said a commercial business could not have, could not serve alcohol in any place that had like uh, pubic hair on display. In other words, a, a strip club. And so, like, obviously, no one, you know, you can't have a strip club without alcohol or, a, you know. Anyway, it, let's just say it helped clear up the problem pretty fast. So I guess we have just time. Thank you very much for one more question. So we'll have to have a little bit of time for a book signing. Sure, it's a very quick question. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing uh, your work with us. Uh, my question is, my first, it's my understanding that serial killers are actually psychopath. They must have some sort of abnormality to do what they do. My question is, how do we recognize them in our communities? And how do we protect ourselves and our children from that? Thank well, you. You know, not all serial killers um, officially 
you know, you define psychopathy by the hair psychopathy test. Um, it's, I think, 30 questions that are posed by an interviewer. Um, not all serial killers necessarily test as psychopaths. And in fact, we're not quite sure what psychopathy is. Uh, you know, it depends on the psychiatrist uh, defining it at, at this point. Um, but there's certainly, you know, you have the, the, you know, in terms of how do you protect yourself, um, my answer would be is trust your intuition. The one most common story you hear in cases of um, survivors, especially women, uh, because women are predominantly targeted by serial killers, um, is that they didn't know why they suddenly had a sense of something not quite right. It was their intuition. And what intuition is, actually, is, is you see something that is a clear sign of danger, but your brain has not explained it to you yet rationally. And the case I remember most kind of vividly, you know, illustrating you know, what we laugh at as female intuition. There's nothing laughable about it. It's, it's, a, it's a very powerful thing. Uh, was um, a woman who survived Ted Bundy. Well, one thing that Ted Bundy used to do is he had a Volkswagen, and he removed the front seat, and then he would put his arm in a fake cast, go on campus, uh, and put a pile of books on the hood of his Volkswagen, and ask a potential target victim if they would help him with his books, put him in the car, and as he would open the door for her and, and, and she would lay the books down and would strike her with the cast, mocking her unconscious into the empty seat. And so this particular woman, um, of course she would help him. When he opened the door, when she saw that there was a missing front seat in the Volkswagen, for no logical reason, immediately her intuition told her danger. And, and I think we're all equipped with that. So uh, listen to your intuition is, you know, the most important piece of advice that anybody can give you on how to survive a serial killer. I'd like to just add to that just for a second too. I've seen so many cases where someone's like, I'm going to tie you up because I'm going to rob you. And even in cases where grown men are involved, in fact, I think most of the cases I have in mind, grown men were involved. And you're banking on that that person's not lying to you in that case. So. I always keep in mind, like, and you're going to be shocked when it happens, if, if somebody pulls out a gun on you or else otherwise threatens you and says, I want to rob you, I'm just going to tie you up so you can go and tell the police and I can get away, uh, don't necessarily believe that they're going to go through with what they say. Uh, this is how a whole family was killed by Dennis Rader, BTK. Um, the father of that family was an ex-army man. He was, he, he was equipped to defend his family, at least better than he did, but because he trusted what the offender said, it resulted in all four of them being killed. And one more additional thing, always do the opposite of what the, of what the person who is trying to gain control of you wants you to do. So if they say stop screaming, scream more. The reason they're telling you to stop screaming is because it's screwing up their plans. And for heaven's sakes, never let them take you to another location. Uh, you always have to keep in mind the worst case scenario. It's always better to gamble with, with your life and maybe get in a struggle and get wounded than it is to be immobilized or incapacitated and all of a sudden you can't fight back anymore. Don't get into the car. Yeah, well, thank with, you very uh, much. Oh, thank you very much. I know we, can, we could carry on for quite some time, but it's getting late. And we want to have time if people would like to uh, to buy any books or have them signed. And the library closes at 8:30, so we need to leave some time. So I want to thank you very much, Peter, for bringing to us.